Yeah, good afternoon. We are still waiting for the last participants to, to join. So we'll just give it a little bit of time. But uh, yeah, welcome to the webinar. And uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, bridge safety and uh, accessibility improvements on the store built link, including a model for wind induced vehicle overturning. And uh, the webinar is uh, arranged by. Uh, YAPSE, the uh, International Association for Bridge and Structural Engineering. Um, and uh, YAPSE is uh, an uh, organization with a, a mission to exchange knowledge and advance the practice of structural engineering uh, around the world. Uh, we have a 2,500 members in 100 countries um, issuing a, a journal and uh, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, papers and proceedings, bulletins. Uh, in YAPSE, we have uh, national groups. Uh, I'm uh, located in, in Denmark and uh, uh, we have around uh, 60 national groups um, and uh, 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 different uh, task groups as well, where uh, many interesting subjects are uh, discussed and uh, uh, shown at uh, conferences. And uh, this is a, a video I will uh, I will uh, continue uh, without showing the the full video. Um, we have uh, young engineers, and uh, we have uh, some discounts and some uh, benefits for uh, young engineers. So that's very interesting, uh, and uh, very importantly, we have uh, some conferences uh, next year. Uh, there's a conference in uh, in Manchester in April, and there's a conference in San Jose in Costa Rica in uh, September, which uh, you definitely should uh, consider participating in. And uh, there's a lot of national group events in uh, in Denmark. We recently had a technical visit to the Storstrom's Bridge. Uh, a large uh, bridge we are constructing uh, here in, uh, in the southern part of Denmark. Um, but uh, this was a little bit about uh, Japse. So you can read more at japse.org. Um, and now to the 
uh, presentation from uh, from Lyngby. Um, about today's subject. I'm the moderator. Um, so uh, these are some nice pictures from the site located. Uh, my name is Lars Fuhr Peterson. I'm, uh, I'm vice president at uh, the Danish uh, consulting uh, engineers and bridge specialists uh, at Google. And uh, I'm a former uh, bridge owner and technical director uh, uh, at Sun and Belt, uh, where uh, Finn, uh, the first speaker, is a project director and is a, a bridge owner, uh, and uh, he's in charge of uh, reinvestment projects and has also been responsible for this uh, this uh, project. The uh, the second speaker uh, is. Uh, Alan Larsen, uh, working in Kofi, um, and uh, Alan is uh, lead for wind engineering design and has been involved in uh, in uh, many world class uh, uh, cable supported bridges, including, of course, the the Great Belt, the Store Belt uh, link, and uh, but also uh, around the world. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Nils. Uh, Bitch, who's from Kowi. Uh, he's a project director and has uh, been uh, very much involved in this uh, project we're speaking about today. So uh, Nils is going to, to tell us some, some uh, details about the project as well. So now to the agenda. And uh, of course, first this introduction that I'm uh, making now. Then Finn will speak about uh, diversion of traffic and uh, safety uh, and uh, how we can communicate that to the uh, customers. Um, and uh, Ellen will explain the consequences of uh, wind, uh, including the overturning accidents. Then uh, Nils will uh, uh, talk about and show us a little bit uh, more about the design and uh, uh, installations and, uh, of course, the calculations behind them. And uh, Finn will, uh, will explain about the preventive measures that has been taken on the, on the bridges. And finally, I will conclude. Then, uh, as you can see, uh, on this uh, map here uh, of Europe, uh, for all of you who are not from Scandinavia, uh, in uh, in the uh, upper uh, corner here, the Denmark is a small country, but uh, we have a lot of uh, islands and a long coastline of seven thousand kilometers and a lot of bridges. Um, we are. Uh, are linking Central and Southern uh, and uh, Northern Europe, and uh, the store built uh, bridge comprises uh, both uh, bridges and a tunnel on an 18 kilometer long distance. And we're also working on a, a tunnel, a uh, fixed link to Germany, uh, immersed tunnel, which uh, has a total value around 10 billion US dollars, uh, and uh, it will be the the world's largest immersed tunnel when it's complete. Then, regarding the store belt link, on this slide I've shown the, the main figures. It's a, it's a very uh, critical part of the Danish infrastructure. It's the second largest uh, bridge in, in Europe. It accounts for uh, around 90% of the Danish east-west uh, traffic. Uh, around 25 million uh, people uh, per year. And uh, uh, this is around five times the, the Danish uh, population. And a lot of ships are passing under it, 25,000 per year uh, into the Baltic Sea. Uh, it has a, a very long required uh, lifetime 
and uh, of course uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, focus on the environment due to the location that it has so uh, on the next slide you can see um, the a closer look uh, of of a map around the the store built link to the left the the low bridge to the right the high bridge and the uh, the tunnel and on the next slide you can see the challenges that we we have had and uh, in a minor degree still have on the on the bridge and they are uh, that uh, that vehicles uh, can overturn due to wind uh, on the bridge um, and uh, we can see that wind sensitive uh, vehicles can drive unsafe on the on the uh, bridge even when we issue have issued warnings and uh, when uh, and if accidents uh, accidents uh, happens we uh, we can have uh, uh, standstill traffic on on major link and uh, on this major link between East and West Denmark, and uh, we can have uh, lost goods um, uh, when we have uh, windy conditions. Uh, we can we see lost goods which is lost on the on the bridge, and uh, then uh, we need traffic management when we have accidents or special events uh, to uh, take care of the of the traffic. But this was the introduction. And uh, now uh, you will uh, continue, Finn. You are muted. Okay, now you should be able to hear us. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, webinar. My name is uh, Finn Godfredsen, as it says here on the slide. Uh, first, I will give an introduction to the, to the project that we will be presenting today. Um, this is a project that uh, has been uh, went on, on at Storebelt for the last three years. Uh, and it has a, a strong focus on, on safety and accessibility, which is also a major focus point for, for Son and Belt, the owner of the, of the link. Uh, we found that there were some things we could do though to improve safety and accessibility. Uh, and the background is that over the past five years before the start of the project, as uh, Lars mentioned, we have uh, a number of uh, serious accidents, and some of them caused uh, a total closure of the bridge for several hours, uh, which meant that uh, the traffic between eastern, eastern and western part of Denmark more or less broke down. Uh, so it has a major impact on the, on, the, on the country and the traffic. Also, we found that uh, doing uh, work on the, on the road, we had several accidents involving uh, um, the uh, safety barriers and so on, which was also made it unsafe for people to work on the bridge. We also wanted to improve that. Uh, and finally, we had uh, this problem with wind sensitive vehicles that uh, caused uh, accidents almost every year. And further, we have a tradition in Denmark to uh, have these special events which involve the link. That could be a bridge race, it could be on bike, or it could be running, as you can see on the and the pictures uh, in the corner. Uh, and as some of you may also know, we, in, in fact, we had uh, Tour de France um, crossing the bridge uh, last year during uh, one of the uh, stages, which was a huge uh, uh, event in Denmark, uh, especially because we like uh, bike riding very much. So it was a pleasure that we could have that event on the, on the bridge. But of course, that's once in a lifetime. Okay, the scope and the goals of the 
of the project was to uh, to uh, implement four places where we could have what we call diversions, where we could uh, make the traffic run uh, diverted so we could run uh, bi-directional on one part of the bridge while, while the other part was uh, closed for traffic. I'll come back how that works. Also, we improved uh, traffic management uh, in order to handle traffic better during diversions. Uh, we had 204 new VMS signs put up. We had 11 new boom barriers um, and also some new road marking, which is these, uh, what we call double hazard warning lines. So uh, that's, that's a major uh, part of the project. And the goal was, uh, of course, to improve accessibility during uh, uh, accidents that would uh, normally uh, close the, the link. Also, uh, this causes, uh, if you have a few uh, fewer accidents, that also will improve the general uh, security for road users. We want to make it very safe for people to work on the link when they do uh, maintenance work. And finally, we want to optimize traffic uh, management during these special events that I talked about just previously. <clears throat> Here we see a, a layout of the, of the project uh, to the top uh, left. You see a, a map showing with uh, five, four red dots where we have these uh, diversions where you can uh, divert the traffic from one part to the to other, as you see on the pictures to the, to the right. And uh, in practice, with these four diversions, it, it is possible to divert the traffic either locally on the east bridge, locally on the west bridge, or we can do it on the whole link. But we cannot divert the traffic locally on the on the Sproy island we have in the middle. Uh, because there's simply not a, enough room for all the signs and warnings we need to, to do the diversion. Okay. Here we see a closer look at the principle of the of the diversion. Uh, on the top, we see traffic uh, under normal circumstances where we have two lanes in, in both directions. And then we see these uh, movable parts of the central area. Uh, here they are closed on the top when you have normal traffic. Uh, if we want to divert the traffic, we can open these uh, uh, movable parts of the central barrier and allow uh, traffic to uh, be diverted to one part of the bridge. So we have bi-directional traffic on one part and the other part is closed. Here shown as a working area. That could also be an area where we have a, a, a serious accident that we need uh, time and room to, to uh, clean up. So that's uh, the principle. Here we see some, uh, it's a visualization, but uh, it actually looks very much like uh, what it is in, in, in practice. So we see uh, the movable uh, barrier has opened. And we, on the left, we see uh, cars uh, approaching the diversion so they can go on the, what you could call the wrong side of the, of the bridge. So we have bi-directional traffic. Uh, on the right, you see it uh, more from the, from the top. And we see one of these boom barriers with, that we have to install to make sure that people not, would not go around the diversion uh, through the emergency line, uh, lane. Uh, but on the other hand, it can open for the emergency services so they can go to the uh, accident area if that's uh, most relevant. We uh, have a, an improved traffic management uh, installed doing this, um, this project. Um, so we can uh, make sure to, to uh, control the uh, traffic uh, both doing that diversion, but also, and not the least important, uh, when we have to implement the diversions, uh, and also when we have to go back to normal traffic. At these times, we have to uh, to close the traffic uh, fully on the bridge and uh, and empty the bridge, and then we can uh, uh, put up the diversion, and then we can open again for traffic, and then it will be diverted. And really, we have to. Uh, close again when we go back to normal traffic uh, for, for some time. We have to close uh, the uh, empty the bridge for, for vehicles before we can uh, go back to normal traffic. But uh, 
And to that, we have uh, VMS signs uh, and, and the barriers. Uh, and the VMS signs are also uh, used to, to warn people when we have bi-directional uh, traffic that they are, they are not allowed to overtake and so on. OK. If you see the principal uh, layout of the diversion with all the signs, so we can push, we can take them one at a time. If you start from the from the right, they are warned that uh, something will be uh, uh, exceptional. That there will be a diversion of the of the traffic. Then they have to be uh, go into one one lane before they uh, enter the diversion, and the the. the Speed is uh, limited to 50 uh, kilometers per hour when they pass through the diversion. And they are warned again that they have to uh, cross the central barrier to go uh, into a bi-directional traffic. When they are in the, the diverged uh, area, they are um, told regularly they are not allowed to overtake. And also they are, in the beginning, they are warned that the people will be coming uh, towards them. And then generally over, uh, on the diverse part of the bridge, they are allowed to uh, to go 80 kilometers an hour. Then when they have to go back uh, in the other end, they uh, again, the uh, speed is limited to 50 kilometers an hour through the diversion. And again, they want that uh, the, the lane will be uh, diverse. Then, after the diversion, the speed is going back to normal, which is 110 on the bridge. Uh, and then we go back to the normal uh, uh, sign saying that uh, lawyers and HTVs are not uh, allowed to overtake, which is also the normal situation on the bridge. Here we see some uh, visualizations of the of the VMS signs uh, on the bridge uh, during an, a diversion. We see that we have these uh, VMS signs in both sides of the of the of the road, that is in on the side of the bridge and also in the central barrier, and especially in the central barrier that gave way to some uh, challenges, which I will come back to in a, in, a, in a minute. And also, you can see that in each uh, okay, just go back. in each uh, uh, section we have in fact six six signs because you can have the, the bidirectional uh, traffic on both sides of the bridge and the cars can go in each direction. So on the, each of these uh, cross sections, we have six VMSs. So that's why we end up having to install uh, 204 uh, VMS signs on this uh, link, which is approximately 20 kilometers long. Thank you. Here we see a principal section. Uh, this is from the East Bridge, where we have the, the new VMS signs uh, put up on the side and also in the uh, central area. Below we see a, a, a sign, a drawing showing on the, on the right. We see how it is on the on the east bridge. Um, the posts for the VMSs were put on top of the the, uh, the cool. posts for the uh, crash barrier. Uh, Niels will come back to the more details about the actual design. Uh, on the left. We see how the uh, the posts were installed on the side of the west bridge, which is a, a concrete bridge with a, a beam on the on the side. Um, it worked quite well. We had this uh, console uh, put on top of the of the beam, uh, and then uh, we could put the signpost on top of that. Uh, okay, what what the problem or the challenge about the central barrier was that it's only the original central barrier is only 60 centimeters wide. Um, that was not enough for the signs that we want to put up the sign the VMS boards. We had uh, uh, we were allowed to have them only one meter uh, wide, which is in fact not uh, what they should be, but uh, that's what we could give, give room for, and we had a uh, we were allowed to, to have uh, them only one meter in, in, in width. But then in, in order to avoid uh, too many uh, events where the, the signpost or the sign itself was, was hit by uh, passing cars, we widened the central barrier locally around each uh, signpost in the middle. 
we see here some pictures from from the from the actual uh, structure. And I see uh, on the next slide we see um, we see some drawings with more uh, details. Um, the central barrier on Storbelt is Curtis made. It's a special design. Uh, it was made long before uh, CE marking and so on. So uh, it's it's quite uh, it's quite stiff. Uh, but we decided to um, to to copy the original design. Uh, so the whitening, uh, the whitened part is is uh, more or less equal to the original part, and it could simply be. Uh, Put on top of the of, of the old one, so the old one stayed in place, and then we we installed the widened part on uh, on that, and it worked quite well. Uh, but it took some time to to design, I could say. Then also we have a, a number of boom barriers to uh, control the traffic. Uh, on the top uh, picture, we see a car which is passing one of the boom barriers. Here it's uh, it's open for traffic, so it's only the 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 one lane that is closed. So so we are sure that we have only one lane with traffic before going to the diversion. But we can also see that there is a, a longer boom barrier which is used to close the traffic when uh, we are installing or uh, making ready for the diversion. And to the right in the picture, we see uh, the boom barriers that I talked about that we have in the emergency lane to make sure that the that people do not enter the closed area. Uh, on the sketch below, we have uh, a lot of uh, boom barriers uh, shown. Um, I can see is tell you that the orange one was the one, the ones we had uh, uh, from the beginning uh, uh, when the bridge was first uh, designed, and then the blue ones are the ones we had to install, uh, especially for the diversion. So when all in all, we installed uh, 11 boom barriers uh, across the, the link for this project to supplement the existing boom barriers. Yes. Um, initial use of diversion, it took several years to implement the whole project, but uh, we were very keen on, on uh, making use of the diversions when they were initially installed, which was the first part of the of the project that was installed. So uh, we used it the first time uh, in a, the night between the 10th and 11th of June, 2021. Uh, at this time, only the movable barriers were ready. Uh, signboards and, and uh, boom barriers were not uh, yet uh, fully in place. So instead of the boom barriers, we put up a number of TMAs, which you can see on the on the pictures to the right. And then we had a, a, a system where we prepared a lot of uh, signs uh, across the bridge, which was then uh, by some people when we uh, were establishing the, the diversion, they went across the bridge and, and raised these uh, pre-ready uh, uh, Signs. Uh, so it took some some uh, manual work uh, in this in this phase, but it worked quite well. Um, this the first uh, use was was planned, so we could uh, make sure that everybody was ready, and it, it worked quite well. The second time we used it was uh, during a major accident. I'll come back to that later about uh, how it went, but uh, that was the. 13th of October in the same year, 2021. Um, so here it was not planned, but uh, even that, uh, uh, despite of that, it, it worked quite well. Um, and at this point, the boom barriers, in fact, were in place. So it was only the, the signboards that we had to put up manually. Um, a little bit more details about this uh, accident that we had on, on uh, in June, uh, October 2021. Uh, it was an HGV who drove directly into a smaller, slow driving lorry. And we could see on the video, uh, by, by chance, we had uh, some video of the accident and we could see that the HGV driver, he didn't touch the brakes at all. He just ran directly into this smaller uh, lorry that for some reason was driving very slow. Um, the impact was so powerful, in fact, that the HTV lost the cap. 
uh, doing the accident. Um, after the police came to the to the spot, they decided that uh, this was a very uh, uh, a very um, uh, heavy accident. So we uh, they want to make use of these uh, new diversions. So we could uh, instead of have a lot of queue uh, building up, we could try to uh, to uh, have the the traffic running again. Uh, and the timeline is uh, shown here. The accident happens uh, in the morning at 7.54. Uh, it was in the westbound lane. So this lane was closed uh, for traffic uh, in order to not have too many cars building up behind the, the accident. And the closure was going, taking place from, from uh, 08.09 uh, to 08.32. Then for some while, they opened again for the westbound traffic, which could then pass the, the accident. Uh, but then uh, the police, as I said, they decided that they want to divert the traffic so that uh, there were room and, and uh, peace to, to clean up after the, the accident. So then we had to close uh, all the traffic in both directions uh, for a little bit more than 15 minutes to prepare for the diversion. And then it was opened again uh, at 10.05. And for approximately one and a half hour, we ran bi-directional traffic uh, uh, passing the, 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 the accident, uh, so it went well. And uh, after cleanup, we could uh, again uh, resume normal traffic uh, <coughs> about uh, four hours after the accident. Mm -hmm. But we can see that uh, we could uh, um, establish uh, diverse traffic uh, in approximately 15 minutes. And also it took uh, from 11.27 to 11.44 which is uh, less than 20 minutes to uh, to go back to normal traffic. So uh, the diversion proved very effective. Then uh, we will try to show a little uh, video from the from this accident. Uh, we have to change here. So to see, uh, stop sharing. Uh, just a minute. Ah. Sorry. It goes. So here we see uh, this is uh, east of the of the link. So in the background we see the east bridge, and here we clearly see how uh, Loris and and. Uh, Passenger cars pass through the diversion. Here you see by bi-directional traffic on the road. And here we look the other way uh, against the toll station. Uh, this is where the diversion starts. So again, you can clearly see uh, how cars are passing by and through the diversion point. And these uh, uh, movable barriers in the, in the central barrier, they can be remotely uh, um, opened and closed, so uh, it's it's quite effective. I hope you could follow the... the video. We go back to the presentation. Um, in fact, we, we uh, planned or, or decided to, to have these diversions due to uh, a number of serious uh, accidents, but uh, it has proven afterwards that uh, we, in fact, use it more uh, when, uh, when we do plant maintenance work, and it's, it's uh, proven to be very, uh, very uh, good for that, because uh, you can close uh, part of the bridge. Uh, still run the traffic uh, and we do that when we do it uh, during the night hours uh, we can still uh, have the traffic flowing without queues uh, that means that we have to have be below 1350 vehicles per hour approximately in both or uh, in each direction if we are below that number we can uh, we can uh, have the traffic running without uh, building up a queue 
Uh, so it's only these uh, 15, 20 minutes that we have to uh, close uh, to uh, make ready for the diversion and afterwards to, to go back to normal traffic that will annoy the traffic. Uh, however, also we have to, uh, to uh, reduce the uh, allowed speed from 110 to uh, 80 kilometers during a diversion. And then there are some limitations on traffic. Uh, uh, we cannot allow any what we call abnormal transports, which are transports that need special permit due to size or, or weight. Also, we cannot allow uh, vehicles uh, with a width more than 3.3 meters or uh, a weight above 100 tons during diversions. But uh, most traffic can run as, as usual. So it, it has proven to be very effective. And I think in this year, in 2023, we used it more than, uh, than 20 times because we had to uh, exchange the asphalt on uh, 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 most of the bridge. And, that was very effective. I think that was it. Thank you. That was me for now. No, I have one more. Sorry. <laughs> you continue, <laughs> I continue. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> also, what we are highly focused on at uh, Storbelt uh, and Sonnenbelt is um, how we can make, uh, how we can optimize uh, uh, safety on the road uh, uh, for our road users do, uh, using uh, communication. Uh, and we have a number, a number of channels uh, to inform our customers about the current condition. Uh, and they are listed here. I will not go through it all. Uh, of course, we have a homepage. Also, uh, I'll come back to that later, but uh, we have what we call a windy season in Denmark, which is from October to February. And before that, we try usually have a special campaign where we make uh, people aware that uh, now we are uh, getting close to this windy season, so they have to be careful when they drive uh, over the bridge. Also, we have uh, uh, special services where you can, uh, where you can, uh, uh, that you can um, uh, have uh, for free, uh, either on SMS or on an email, so you can uh, have a notice every time there is something special going on on the bridge. And also that is very popular. Uh, and finally, we have um, uh, try to have a good dialogue with uh, different professional organizations uh, in Denmark um, to make sure that uh, when we have uh, projects or, or, or activities that uh, will impact the, the accessibility, they, they know that in advance. Here we see something, uh, the, the information we have on our homepage about uh, traffic restrictions during wind. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, in more detail later, but uh, there are something about, uh, depending on the wind, there are some restrictions to the traffic, uh, and we work quite a lot with that, uh, and that will be part of this presentation to, to tell about that. Uh, we have some, you could call it challenge, or you could say that it's a good thing, but we see uh, uh, quite a... Uh, uh, huge impact uh, uh, increase in traffic uh, across the Sober link uh, from year to year. Of course, we had a small uh, uh, reduction in traffic during uh, uh, COVID-19, but it's more than picked up again. Uh, but also, we have a lot of uh, customers uh, in the summertime which are not used to drive on this bridge, which we are also very uh, uh, keen on uh, helping them. But we see, despite of that, that sometimes we have uh, congestion and queues in, the, in our toll station. And uh, clearly, people are very, uh, they don't have much time. They are not very patient. So they start to, uh, to uh, shift uh, several lanes just before uh, going to the toll station. And we see people going uh, reverse. Uh, um, so if you if you sit and watch the traffic for half an hour someday, you 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 think it cannot be true that they are driving like that, but uh, people are in a hurry. Of course, this is an area where they are not driving too fast. So uh, so even though we have some some uh, accidents, they are usually with very minor damages. Uh, we have also had a few accidents with people uh, cars speeding uh, more than maybe twice what they allowed. 
uh, this is a give way to very serious accidents, but uh, but uh, luckily they are not very frequent. And I think they are hard to do anything about because there are people that are very difficult to reach that are driving like this. Uh, I mentioned before, and I'll come back to that later also, we have a collision with barrier equipment and uh, on a regular basis when we work on the bridge. Uh, therefore, we try to, to use or, or do the most work in, in these uh, diversions where we have a, an area without traffic where we can work safely. Uh, and also we still have uh, have had all year uh, over the whole opening of the bridge uh, these wind sensitive vehicles that cause problems and we see one one example here with a trailer that has uh, has uh, turned over on the bridge in uh, windy weather and, and with this window uh, as a sail on, on top of the trailer yeah here uh, just a few examples to show uh, how we try to to be very um, um, cautious when we work on the bridge. So this is two uh, standard uh, examples uh, of the, the markings we use uh, when we work on the bridge. The top one is, is what we call a movable uh, work area. So that, that you can use, for instance, if you want to do some inspection of the central barrier. So this, uh, this uh, uh, marking, they will simply be uh, they can they can be moved, uh, so it's for very short term work. On the bottom, we have a, a what we call a stationary uh, short term work area, uh, which is uh, very heavily uh, equipped with uh, marking equipment. Uh, and usually, we have not we don't have um, permanent working areas on the bridge uh, for several days. Uh, so usually, if you do this work kind of work, we put it up in the morning, for instance, and then uh, in the afternoon we we take it down again uh, to make sure that uh, we will not uh, we will not uh, implement uh, reduce the accessibility more than, than we need to. We, we don't. It's very very seldom that we have more permanent uh, working areas established on the bridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just uh, uh, a little bit focus on these problems we had with uh, uh, lorries and, and HDVs, uh, which run into our um, um, the marking uh, material that we have on the bridge. Here I have some examples from, from two years, 2020 and 2021. Um, some of them are quite serious. We have HDVs that runs directly into a parked GMA. Uh, you should think that they can see it, but uh, apparently they are doing other things than looking out the front window when they are uh, driving. Um, so some of these uh, accidents have been quite serious, but uh, luckily we have not had any workers uh, being killed by, by these accidents. And of course, we expect the frequency to, to fall drastically because we will be doing more and more work in, uh, in these diver uh, doing these diversions where we have a safe working area. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons why we, we do this. Yeah, thank you. I think that was then all for me. And Alan will take over. Well, thank you, Finn, for passing over to me. Um, so the subject of my little talk is understanding and reducing overturning accidents caused by wind. So from opening of the bridge in 1998 to 2019, um, a statistical record was made of all wind-induced accidents happening on the bridge. I presume it is still going on, but the data uh, we processed was from the years 1998 to 2019. And then a total of um, a total of 56 wind-induced accidents were recorded. That's approximately three per year spread over the 19 21 years. Uh, uh, the statistics last for. 
and 33 of those accidents happened on the suspension bridge at the pylons or the anchor blocks. The typical accidents involve motor vehicles, car van, towing, empty box trailers. And on the right hand side, you see a picture of such a typical accident, an empty box trailer overturned near the gate of the pylon. Now, in order to get a little feel for uh, uh, what they are, this video, which I will play, shows a westbound small truck towing a larger box trailer. The video starts when the uh, trailer and truck combination is just approaching the anchor block. So here we go. Now it's passing the anchor block and there it goes over. So you see the truck jumping in the air and bumping into the uh, guardrails. And of course, traffic stops. So this is one of the incidents that needs diversions. We'll show it again just because PowerPoint thinks that this is appropriate. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's spectacular anyway. Then we do not have a similar video, unfortunately, for an accident happening near to the pylon of the uh, Great Belt Bridge. But what we do have is a video of a similar accident happening at Sotra Bridge in Norway. At the day of the accident, the wind blowed at a speed of 24 meters per second, which is the sign, it's not very obvious, but this is a sign warning traffic. And from the windsock, we see that is winds across the bridge. So here goes the video. So you see the trailer approaching the gate of the pylons, passing the gate, and there it goes. And again, much similar uh, action really, as was shown on the East Beach, passing the anchor blocks. Now, we want to understand the anatomy of uh, um, wind-induced overturning accidents. So what you see is the top view of a SUV towing a box trailer. And it travels along the path of the bridge at a speed V. The trailer has a length L and a width V. So what this means is that the trailer will experience a headwind equal to the travel speed. Now, if we do have a wind, a natural wind crossing the path, we will have in red the wind speed called U, and it approaches the path of travel at an angle beta. And summing these two up, will give a relative wind speed, which is actually what is uh, uh, the incident wind experienced by the trailer. We can do a bit of trigonometry and we can find that the reduced wind speed and the sign to the inflow angle alpha as is given in the right-hand side. We will not dive into that. Now, seen in an end view, we have the relative wind across to the vehicle of height H and the aerodynamic center at a height CLA, above ground. And then we have a wind force, which equals half rho times the relative wind speed squared times the side area times an aerodynamic coefficient. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's a non-dimensional coefficient and it's a function of the aerodynamic characteristics of the vehicle, the position of the vehicle on the bridge and the inflow angle. And it is shown that the inflow angle uh, roughly is a function of the angle of inflow assigned function of the, uh, of the inflow angle. And we can measure this in wind tunnel tests. And also the vehicle is acted upon by gravity. So there's a gravity force acting in the center of gravity, which equals the mass of the vehicle M times the acceleration of gravity. Now, if we want to change conditions We can introduce a windscreen, which is marked by the dashed line. And what the windscreen does is that it reduces the wind speed uh, crossing the vehicle. And of course, it reduces the relative wind speed as well as the inflow angle alpha. And uh, on the picture, on the left, on the right-hand side, uh, down at the bottom, you see a possible layout of such a screen, a vertical picket fence arrangement. Now, in order to understand how overturning occurs, we can make a simple force balance. That is the wind force relative to the moment by the wind force uh, uh, balances the moment due to gravity. And if we do this, which is on the left hand, well, we get an equation for the relative wind speed at which over training occur as a stability parameter S divided by the moment coefficient. And the stability parameter involves all the parameters of the vehicle and CM takes the aerodynamics into account. And we normalize for this, we normalize the aerodynamic force by the approach wind speed. That is the wind speed upwind of the bridge itself. Now for crosswinds, we can simplify the equations for the relative wind speed and the sign of the inflow angle to arrive at a little formula for the travel wind speed at which the vehicle will overturn VOT given as a 3.6 divided by the, the approach wind speed and then the square root of the stability parameter squared, the aerodynamic coefficient squared minus the approach wind speed to the power four. And if we look at how, how this plots, the overturning wind speed as a function of the approach wind speed, we can see that for a stability parameter of 800, which is typical of a vehicle and an aerodynamic coefficient of two, well, then we have the red line. So increasing the approach wind speed, we decrease the wind speed for overturning. And now if the aerodynamic coefficient is lower, decreases from two to one, we get the blue curve, but it's the same relative uh, uh, function overturning wind speed as function of approach wind speed. Small box trailers usually are allowed to drive 80 kilometers an hour in this country. 
So if we do this and look at the uh, uh, case having an aerodynamic coefficient of two, well, then we do get an estimated overturning wind speed of approximately 15 meters per second. If we move to the case, having an aerodynamic coefficient of one, well, then the overturning speed, traveling speed, inc no, overturning wind speed, I'm sorry, increases to 25 meters per second as indicated by the blue arrow. A little look at the stability parameter. The stability parameter involves the width of the vehicle, or the wheelbase of the vehicle, the mass of the vehicle, the acceleration of gravity, the air density, the overall length of the vehicle, the height of the vehicle body, and the height of the aerodynamic center above the roadway. Now, manufacturers and providers' status bases were researched to find the above physical properties of common vehicle types to determine the mean stability parameter and the standard deviation of this. A characteristic value for each group of vehicle is defined as the mean minus the standard deviation. And now this definition then aided definition of critical speed limits for various types of vehicles traveling the bridge. And now here we see typical values for empty commercial vehicles, that being a large truck trailer, a van, and a large box, tra box trailer, much similar to the one we saw overturning in the first video. And we can see that the characteristic stability parameter is about 1,400 for the truck trailer and the van, but it's only 700 for the large box trailer. Similarly, we can look at private vehicles. There's a typical small box trailer, which you can rent in every service station in this country. There's a caravan and there's an SUV. SUV. And you will see that the caravan and the small box trailer have very low characteristic values. In fact, the characteristic value of the large box trailer and the small box trailer sort of sets the lower bounds of the stability parameters. Now, having fixed the stability parameters, we must look at finding the overturning moment coefficients. And this is done from wind tunnel tests. Here we see wind tunnel models at scale one to 30 of the pylon roadway combination on the top line and the anchor block roadway combination on the bottom row. And also you see a small model of the box trailer encircled in red. So to recapture the definition of the moment coefficient, it's simply the overturning moment due to the wind divided, divided by the uh, stagnation pressure of the wind, of the approach wind, and the side area of the vehicle and the height of the aerodynamic center. So the approach wind speed is what happens upwind of the bridge at some distance. And we can measure, as shown, uh, um, the aerodynamic coefficients in wind tunnel tests using a stationary vehicle model, that is, the travel speed of the vehicle equals zero. Okay. Only a very few wind tunnels worldwide allow measurements on moving models. They're very expensive, 
and very cumbersome to use. Now, on the bridge, the local wind speed is not constant. At the pylons, we will see creation of turbulence, which will induce motion, or we can have wind screens, which will reduce the wind speed. On the bridge, far from wind screens or anchor blocks or pylons, well, we can envisage that the local wind speed is much similar to the approach wind speed, and we measure a moment over turning coefficient, CM naught. Well, if we move into the vicinity of the pylon, well, then the approach wind speed and the induced wind speed from the vortices make will combine, and we will measure a larger overturning moment coefficient than we will away from the pylon. Behind the wind screen, well, then the approach wind speed will be reduced, and we will measure a lower moment coefficient than we do on the open bridge. And the picture on the right shows you the wind model, the approach wind speed where it's measured outside the bridge, and the overturning moment trying to flip the small model of the trailer. Now, the small model of the trailer is sitting on a little high frequency balance, which can be sunk into the deck of the bridge model at the positions we want to obtain the overturning moment coefficients. Vehicle overturning is a dynamic and relatively fast process. <clears throat> approximately three seconds. So we will need to measure both the beam components and the fluctuating com components of the wind loading. A peak hour turning moment is thus defined, which combines the mean wind speed, a standard deviation of the uh, moment from the vortex shedding, and the standard deviation of the moment from the wideband turbulence. And again, you see a comparison of spectra of the moment coefficient measured seven meters from the pylons and 50 meters from the pylons in red at seven and in blue at 50. And you'd see that the moment measured away from the pylon, 15 meters away from the pylon is much lower than it is at seven meters. Also, you will notice a peak at the non-dimensional frequency of 0.012, which is, if you go to Eurocode, is equivalent to what you would expect for regular vortex shedding from a square cross-section. And typically, the peak overturning moment will be 70% larger close to the pylon than it is away from the pylon in the open spans. So typically for defining the extent of the wind screen, we measure in different positions along the bridge. And here you see the spectra as we move away from the pylon. And you will note that the both of the peak from, from the vortex shedding and the level of the broadband turbulence goes down as you move away from the pylon. If you put up a windscreen, you will note a substantial reduction of the moment coefficient, which is to be expected. So the along, wind, or the along span extent of the windscreen is taken such that the overturning moment at the positions behind the windscreen is less or equal to the overturning moment at a distance from the pylon, where the wind screens are, where the uh, wind conditions are unaffected by the pylons. And access to the first hangar was also critical. It should not be behind the wind screens. 
So the windscreens are about 22, 23 meters long, extending from the pylon. And here you see a plot of the moment coefficients obtained without the windscreens in red and with the windscreens in place in blue. And if you calculate overturning wind speeds according to the formula, you get on the bridge without the windscreens for a stability parameter of 700, for a traveling speed of 80 kilometers an hour, you get an overturning wind speed of only nine meters per second. Away from the pylons and again going 80 kilometers an hour, you will get an overturning wind speed of 14 meters per second. And behind the windscreens, you will get for the same conditions, 28 meters per second. So these wind tunnel tests and calculations aided in setting wind speed restrictions for traffic on the bridge. And this video will show flow visualization done by, um, this is wrong, it should be. It will show flow visualization, I hope, of the vortices uh, um, hmm. formed behind the pants. So you see on the on the right hand side, you see the wind speed flowing fast. You don't have wind speeds at this point. Whereas on the left hand side, you see the wind speeds. I'm sure you notice less wind of the wind and less turbulence. Just a visualization that the wind speeds perform as expected. While putting up the windscreens, a chance was a chance it appeared to be able to verify the windscreens by traveling across the bridge in an instrumented vehicle. Um, the vehicle was instrumented by three pressure transducers at the size phase of the uh, of the uh, trailer, and the wind conditions was nine meters from the southeast at 45 degrees to the bridge line. And the vehicle was traveling from west to east, meeting first the pylon with the windscreens, then meeting uh, the pylons without the windscreen. So on the left-hand picture, you see out of the windscreen of the car when you approach the pylon with the windscreens, and on the right-hand side, approaching the pylons without the windscreens. So now when you do approach the pylons, the windscreen on the lee side is sitting in the shelter of the pylon itself. So on these curves, which each represent one run across the bridge, you will see the pressure is measured with no windscreen in red and in blue, including the windscreens. So the effect of the windscreens are not felt as the, on the approach as the screens are sitting in the wake of the pylon. So you would see on the left-hand side, the red and the blue graphs are almost coinciding. As you come out of this shelter of the pylon, you, without the windscreens, you will see that the, um, that the wind speed overshoots uh, um, the windscreen or the, the wind speed further down the road by, third, by approximately 30%. And the windscreen, and including the windscreen, then of course, you ramp up in a slower fashion. Also, uh, passing the anchor ropes, you would notice that when you pass, when you pass the anchor ropes, from the west to the east, well, at first, you do 
encounter in red a mean wind speed of about 50 to 80 pascal. Then you pass through the wind speed at times 74. And after having passed the anchor block, the wind pressure increases to about 140 megapascal. Getting to the western, to the eastern anchor block on the right hand side, in blue, you'll see the very same trend on the suspension bridge, having the shallower deck section, you will see a wind pressure of 40 Pascal. And then at the other side, you will see a, a um, wind pressure measured on the vehicle of about 80 meters. And this typically reflects the measured coefficients which are indicated in the figure. Thank you very much. I will now give over to Nils. Thank you very much, Alan. I will uh, continue and uh, tell you a little about the installations, uh, design of the installations to support the things we have just uh, talked about. Uh, and when you do the uh, design of uh, things uh, uh, placed on a bridge or close to the traffic, there are a number of things you will have to consider. Uh, First of all, if it's a cantilevered element, it will probably be subjected to vibrations. And those vibrations, they will cause deflections and uh, is movements uh, that, that will maybe harm the installations you, you have, the equipment you install on the installations. It could be cameras, radars, uh, and other things. Then quite often you also uh, uh, find that you will have uh, fatigue failure in such uh, installations, uh, also caused by the vibrations. Then there are also uh, space limitations. Uh, bridges are often uh, optimized uh, with space, and so to find uh, space for new installations uh, can be difficult. If you have long, long elements or many elements of the same type, you uh, you have uh, several uh, repetitions, uh, and uh, so be careful with the design. They do uh, detail in uh, very good. Then, of course, you will have to consider traffic collision. It can also be things. Uh, uh, lose goods and so, and uh, or lose uh, things uh, on the lorries passing. Um, and if you have a collision and you have to replace the things, you will there will be traffic interruption and so. Uh, so try to optimize uh, those things. Also, if you have to replace it, uh, it should be uh, you should be able to uh, do it very quickly. Maintenance will also occur, of course, uh, in the future, uh, especially on uh, such things like uh, these VMS ports. They will require some uh, maintenance. And finally, if you put up uh, screens, and so it might have a, an impact on the aerodynamic behavior uh, of the bridge. Uh, it, did not in this case, but uh, if you do such uh, uh, things, always uh, consider any impact on the aerodynamic uh, behavior. Just a little about the design of the post for the VMS ports. We have done some item frequency analysis in order to calculate deflections and evaluate uh, the, the possible uh, fatigue failure. Uh, of course, there are both strengths and uh, uh, other things you would have to consider, uh, stiffness and so. Um, and when you do so many of these, it, it was uh, 204 uh, pieces in all, I understand. Uh, be very careful with the, with the design. Uh, and as you can see, the signboards, they measured uh, 2.9. Uh, 
in the meters in height and uh, 1.4 meters in width. So it is quite a surface you will have to support. The board was uh, on the suspension bridge and on the approach bridge of the bridge uh, uh, supported on the existing post for the crash barrier. And it made it very easy to uh, install them. There's the design of the central post for the VMS board. Uh, it had to be installed on a separate uh, base plate welded to the bridge deck. We are not normally not so happy about that, but uh, and in this case, we had to uh, do some extra uh, stiffening inside the, the bridge girder. And of course, there's also you have to. Uh, make space for cabling and wires and so for the communication uh, and also be careful with the details uh, because holes into the inner side of the bridge deck is not very nice to Okay, I'll just bring you a little back in time, uh, back to 1997 when we did the first preparation for these uh, windscreens. Um, it was at that time we expected the screen to be around uh, 55 meters uh, in length on both side of, sides of the pylons and uh, 40 meters uh, on both sides of the anchor blocks. Uh, the screen was uh, made by a perforated steel plate of four millimeters with an open area ratio of 50%. And it was uh, um, three meters in height above the roadway deck. And uh, the post for the press barriers were prepared for the installation. At that time, we uh, had uh, involved the architect for the design and we, uh, together with the uh, Storm belt of the Great Big Bridge, we decided to involve the architects again. And they, of course, came up with a new design of the things. And uh, what you can see here is that it is uh, a totally different thing. Uh, also because uh, that they did not find that the, that the design, original design was uh, able to um, Yes, it, we wanted this a smooth a tapering of the a windscreen uh, from a height of three meters down to the height of the crest barrier. Another thing you can see, this is uh, the design at the anchor block, where we also have to consider that uh, the existence of the expansion joints both towards the approach bridge and uh, towards the suspension bridge. You can see that we have the vertical elements. Uh, and if you look at windscreens uh, on some of the other bridges in Europe, you will find that they have horizontal elements in the windscreens. Of course, there are others with also with vertical screens, uh, uh, vertical lamellas. But, uh, and I know that, uh, uh, People, some owners experience that those uh, screens with horizontal elements, they uh, attract people who want to jump uh, from the bridge. Here a closer view of the system we, we found together with the, the architects. They, uh, from the beginning, they decided to go for a vertical lamellas uh, uh, in acrylic and uh, clamped to horizontal members uh, bolted to the coast of the grass barriers. Uh, we see those acrylic bars used in uh, many windscreens around uh, the world on the bridges uh, so we had uh, one of them 
we bought some one of them to uh, to get more experience with the look of it. And when we started the wind tunnel test in June uh, 2020, uh, we modified the 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 whole uh, concept for the windscreen. We increased the height to 3.5 meters. It was also a result from the the wind tunnel test made back in, in 1997. Uh, we reduced the length to 40 meters from 45, 51 meters to 40 meters around the pylons and uh, 40 meters around uh, the angle blocks. We also decided not just to be, to have uh, this, uh, these acrylic uh, elements. We also decided to introduce uh, aluminum uh, bars and uh, lamellas. And uh, we made two types of type one and one type two. Uh, type two was more if we would like to weld it up and uh, the aluminum type uh, three, two, the, the plector type um, was designed together with the architects. And we did uh, we did also winter tests on uh, uh, these lamellas. Uh, in order to uh, in order to see if there were any uh, vortex induced uh, displacements and how big they were and we found they were uh, almost uh, uh, they were very small uh, down to 0 0.01 millimeters and the shield effect uh, measured on these one to one uh, tests uh, were also almost the same as uh, what we could find on the 1 to 30 scale test. Uh, okay, and we also to get a little more experience with the things, we, we did a prototype installation on the bridge on a three meter section. And we did a lot to make the small details, the fixation of the elements uh, safe and smooth. Uh, you can see that we have introduced uh, some rubber elements uh, in the clamp fixation to the horizontal members uh, to soften the to soften the fixation, but also to dampen and also to, to uh, make it. Uh, as kind of sealing and uh, to avoid uh, direct contact, contact between the aluminium elements and uh, the hot dip galvanized uh, steel structure. Finally, when we uh, finished the wind tunnel test, we decided to avoid and avoid the windscreens on the approach bridge uh, part. That was one of the important results. And uh, we also found out that we could reduce the length from the 40 meters to 23 meters uh, at the pylons and the 22 meters uh, at the anchor block. We decided uh, to do the designed so that we could install the screen in elements of uh, respectively four meters and three meters, depending on uh, the location of it. And uh, the crest barriers were already from the beginning prepared for, for the windscreens, uh, as I told you before. We did uh, quite a number of uh, analysis also, uh, vibration studies on both the aluminum lamellas, the acrylic lamellas, and also some anal analysis of the uh, eigen eigenfrequencies of the, the whole, uh, whole section of uh, four meters. Finally, we also had to decide 
what kind of uh, lamellas we would like to use. And uh, should it be the acrylic lamellas or should it be the al aluminum lamellas? Uh, great with Briggs, Storbe took the decision to install the aluminum lamellas. Um, and they were installed in full sections, three meter sections and the four meter sections. And uh, it was uh, done. We had all in all uh, eight locations where yeah. to install these uh, sections and it took uh, two to four days uh, per location. Yeah, a little view of the details uh, you can find on the bridge. Uh, it is a uh, hot deep galvanized uh, elements and uh, you can see that we have double knots uh, on many places to uh, be sure that uh, things will not lose you. This is uh, how it looks after installation. And what can we conclude on this? We can conclude that the total length of the windscreen was reduced from 724 meters to 272 meters, a reduction of 62% compared to 1997. Uh, it gives, of course, a uh, cost saving. Uh, we had to increase the height from two meters to 3.5 meters. We avoided the windscreen at the approach bridge. We have, uh, we think, uh, got uh, a dedicated optimized design because we involved the architects. Uh, we also find that the installation and maintenance uh, is optimized. It is, uh, you can very quickly uh, replace the things. Then, of course, finally, we have uh, improved the accessibility and the safety on the bridge. Back to me again. Thank you. I think I'll just take a few minutes to uh, talk about the implementation of the preventive measures. Uh, we had to find out how to implement the wind-related uh, traffic restrictions uh, after we had done all these uh, analysis work. First, we can uh, see that uh, at Stobel, we did that in, var at an, in advance. We had uh, these, uh, what we call wind speed categories that you see here. Uh, yeah, again. And also we decided to uh, categorize uh, vehicles based on this uh, stability parameter that was uh, that Ellen was talking about. Uh, so we see that we have this categorization in, in four categories. Uh, VC1 is, VC1 is the most uh, uh, wind uh, uh, sensitive. sensitive, which are these small box trailers uh, up to a weight of uh, approximately 750 kilo, kilos. Then we had the the more moderate uh, sensitive uh, vehicles, which are larger box trailers and caravans. And then we have lorries, and at the end we have uh, normal passenger cars, which are not very sensitive. Yeah. We have to do the the uh, implementation or the put out the traffic restrictions in two steps. Uh, First, we have to warn uh, vehicles uh, approaching the Stobel link if they uh, are prohibited to uh, to cross the link. Uh, I'll come back to that on the next slide. And afterwards, after that, we have to uh, tell people on the bridge what what speed they uh, are uh, allowed to drive. So, so we see normally we have 110 uh, at a wind speed above uh, 15 meters. We uh, decrease this to uh, 90 uh, kilometers, then we decrease it to 70, and then at the end, we uh, we close the bridge. So here we see again uh, the, the, the wind uh, categories, uh, and we see what restrictions we put out. So uh, from 10 to 15 uh, meters per second, uh, 
what we call uh, vehicle category one is not allowed. That's the small box trailers. Uh, when we go up higher, we have uh, category one and two that are not allowed. That is box trailers up to uh, to 2.5 tons. And at the same time, you decrease the, the speed limit on the bridge. Yeah. And here we see the special signs that we had to develop. Uh, I'm not sure they are that easy to understand, but that is what we could uh, we could uh, uh, find out together with the uh, Danish uh, Transport Ministry of Transport. Yeah, bare videre. Uh, bare videre. We still have to. Uh, uh, to, um, to remember, however, that it's always the driver's responsibility to assess whether it will be safe or not to go across the bridge. Uh, so even though it's not directly uh, uh, prohibited, it might not be safe. And it's very difficult to, to show a few signs uh, telling everybody what is, uh, 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 what is safe or not. So this is what we could come up with. And here we see just how we do the pre-warning before the bridge. Uh, on the top uh, right, we see it on the east side. Uh, on the top uh, bottom left, it's on the west side. Uh, so we make sure that uh, people are warned twice before the last uh, exit before the bridge. And here we see uh, a few uh, uh, numbers on the frequency, and we see that uh, the high wind speeds are very are quite quite uh, seldom, uh, and here we see how they are distributed over the years, uh, over the year, typical year. So we see that it's in this in the uh, late um, autumn and during the winter that we have the highest winds. And luckily, we don't have high winds usually in in the summertime where we have a lot of tourists passing the the bridge. So I think that's that's very very good. Uh, I'll just that's how we can warn uh, on doing other adverse conditions on the bridge. We could have a, a, a vehicle in the emergency lane, or we could have an icy road. We could have a lost goods, or a very slow uh, going uh, vehicle. Or uh, finally, we could have a risk of falling ice. We have had that a few times from the main cables that risk uh, that ice was forming and falling down on the road. Uh, luckily, it's only happened a few times over the years. I think I will just uh, skip this because of, of time, and then uh, I'll pass over to Lars for the last uh, conclusion. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Fink. Uh, thank you uh, to all your three speakers. Uh, we are uh, now wrapping up uh, the uh, uh, questions uh, in the Q&A that uh, Finn is uh, answering uh, while I'm just wrapping it up. Uh, but uh, uh, what we can uh, cl conclude is that uh, uh, we have established uh, this uh, theoretical wind formula that Alan was speaking about, that it's uh, correct by the uh, tests that were made. And uh, there's been made calculations for uh, different uh, vehicles. And uh, as Finn mentioned, these calculations has been used to to the new uh, implemented wind restrictions, uh, and they have been uh, reviewed by a traffic uh, safety consultant. Um, further, these uh, barriers that the Finn was showing were actually used for the Tour de France in uh, in Denmark uh, uh, last year. So uh, it's actually a very uh, efficient uh, thing uh, with the uh, movable central barriers uh, to divert the traffic and also very effective and safe for the maintenance work. The uh, different uh, signs and boards uh, are, uh, have been installed. Uh, the, uh, the traffic management is working and the uh, approvals are in place. And uh, actually to, to uh, just to to express uh, that it's uh, it's it's working, the the customers that are uh, passing the bridge are actually very satisfied with these windscreens and the new uh, setup because uh, it makes it easier. Uh, I feel that myself when I cross the bridge to 
past the bridge because the windscreens are really working. And uh, during uh, uh, accidents, the uh, the uh, diversions, the movable central barriers are actually uh, working and working uh, uh, very well. So this is relevant uh, for many bridges uh, and for uh, many bridge owners. But uh, this uh, was uh, implemented uh, now in on the on the store belt link. So. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, attending uh, our presentations, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, that uh, all the questions in the questions and answers uh, have been uh, uh, answered. So thank you very much, and uh, bye for here now. Ja, 61 til, til dage. Okay. Hvorfor skal vi ikke? Er der sådan en lang, 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 lang